Why are interest rates so low? This is a good one from Michael Walker at the Fraser Institute. Now, if you're not familiar with the Fraser Institute, they're Canadian. Uh, so they're righteous. They're uh, on the, the, the capitalistic right, probably the equivalent of the American Enterprise Institute here in the States, uh, Heartland Institute, maybe. Um, you're certainly not right wing, but definitely libertarian right, uh, not libertarian like a Cato either. Uh, but anyway, you know, definitely free markets, free minds kind of people for sure. Uh, so we're going to dive into this because I get all the time, all the time, the Fed is manipulating interest rates. And once the Fed stops doing that, we're going to have a bubble. There's a bubble now. Bubba, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. And you just want to drop an anvil on your head and uh, go into your uh, cave with Gollum and look at my precious. And so my precious is right there. Can you see that guy? Can you see him? Hello, Pablo. Everyone loves you. Anyway, all right, that's a good way to get a video started is by showing my better half. I got two better halves. All right, Dateline, February 2016. Still relevant today, even four years later. And there's the image of their interest rates. So let's dive into this. This is a good article, man. I'm telling you, I'll put a link in the show notes. FraserInstitute.org. Highly recommend you go visit these guys. Um, I'm a huge fan. If you're in Canada, well, you don't have to be in Canada, but certainly support the Fraser Institute. Uh, why are interest rates so low? A framework for modeling current global financial developments. Michael Walker. Uh, let's go into this here. And I can't remember how I came across this one, actually, but uh, we'll, we'll go into this. And I probably won't read the whole thing, but uh, we'll go with the executive summary first. This paper is the latest version of my attempt to convey to others a sense of a model and my understanding about current financial markets that I've been developing and using for his own financial planning. It's an amalgam of simple observations and statistical regularities with some comments about the economic theory toolbox that is in widespread use, but which was not functional in current circumstances. Uh, one of my economist mentors, uh, Harry Johnson, used to say the most things about ec economics are simple. Economics are simple. The problem is to recognize simplicity when you see it. Most things about economics are simple. The problem is to recognize simplicity when you see it. 100% agree. At the core of this paper are a few simple observations. The first is that while the virtues of savings and the evil of indebtedness are wildly understood and universally supported, the fact is every saver who wants to earn a return needs to have a debtor as an accomplice. Because the anonymity, we used to have to say that in AA out loud, I, could, I always got nervous saying anonymity, anonymity, you never say that right, yeah, weird. So you have to read from the book, uh, Bill W. book, the, the big book, the great, I forget things called the big book, and I read out loud and I just, oh, always get sidetracked. <laughs> of financial institutions, the connection is not appreciated and indeed, most people taking a loan or a mortgage think they're getting it from the bank. Of course, they're actually getting it from a saver slash depositor who needs to borrow as much as the borrower needs a saver. The second observation is that our theories for describing whole economies rely on the extrapolation to the national level, what we observe in the uh, behavior of individuals. So the standard theory about interest rates and saving is based on how an economy would behave if it were a simple aggregation of all households on the assumption that they all behave like a typical household. As long as the typical health household is re representative, that's not a problem. However, there is a strong reason to believe that the current economy of the world, uh, if I can call it that, has broken down. And as a consequence, the inf inferences made using the standard model are incorrect, i.e., this is what capitalism makes it so wonderful and so unique and so hard to figure out. Every household is different and unique and all engaged in their own thought process, whether not you think that makes sense or not. For them, it makes sense. All households are rational in their own mind. They might not be rational for you. They might not be rational for freaking Paul Krugman at the New York Times. They might not be rational for uh, Powell, was it Jerome Powell or Ben Branke or any of these guys. But for that household, they are. And so to extrapolate those millions and millions of households into one conglomerate, say this is the economy, it's just, it's, it's dumb. It's crazy. That's where macroeconomics just falls flat on space. The third observation, though not so obvious, is that the only time the representative household model will work for understanding interest rates, and most likely all other economic magnitudes, is when there is population, current population, constant population growth. Constant growth ensures there will always be a typical relationship between borrowers and savers. This is pretty interesting, actually. That typical relationship is that there are always a greater volume of borrowing than saving. 
So interest rates perform the function of rationing the number and volume of borrowers to a pair up with a smaller number of lenders. This paper explores the implications for interest rates when, at its present, population growth is not constant, and when, as a consequence, a relative shortage of borrowers emerge as saver cohorts dominate the population. This is critical. So we histor historically have more borrowers and savers. That means the interest rates act as a temperature or a thermometer, if you will. All right, now we got more savers and borrowers, and what happens then? Mm -hmm. Interesting. The conclusions are that interest rates of the 29 economies that make up 90% of the world's GDP are low because these economies are experiencing a dearth of borrowers and hence a relatively high saver to borrower ratio. The dearth of borrowers have removed the power of monetary policy to increase the inflation rate in many countries because the potency of monetary policy as currently operated is derived from growth and loaned growth in the from loan growth in the banking system. The Japanese deflation experiences has been mad, badly misdiagnosed because the standard model as used in the diagnosis does not work in the Japanese demographic circumstances, or it won't be for ours either. The world's largest economies are rapidly approaching Japan-like demographics and the deflationary implications of that situation. And I, I I cannot stress this enough. The Japanese deflation experience has been badly misdiagnosed because a standard model, i.e. a growing population with more borrowers than lenders, has been thrown on its face, has been completely flipped. And because that model assumes that the lower the interest rates, you're going to have more and more demand for debt. It doesn't work if you have a more and more lenders than you have borrowers to begin with. Uh, all right. Why are interest rates so, let's see, well, how many pages is this? Because I certainly don't want to waste all your time here. Let's see here. We got uh, a 42 and I imagine, let's, uh, so let me pause and see where we want to go here next. Let's read the introduction. I'll pause. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, you know, I'll pause here. Just, I'll read the introduction. I'll pause to see where else I want to go into this. I, I read this a couple times, but uh, I want to go, I, I don't want to take up 50 minutes of your time reading this. Why are interest rates so low? Is it due to the effect of monetary policy and the efforts of central bank to stimulate economic recovery? Is it the result of too much liquidity, liquidity sloshing around the world economy as an after effect of the world economic crisis? Is it the declining rate of inflation that has followed the widespread use of inflation targeting by central banks? Whatever is causing the downward trend in interest rates and the yields on other assets, is that temporary? Is, that, is it a temporary development or the harbinger of a very different sort of financial future? This paper contends that the answer to this and other questions that will continue to crop up in financial markets may be found in consideration of demographic patterns and how they work throughout the structure of the economy. While there's much, much discussion of demographics, there seems to be very little integration of this discussion to the popular or professional consideration of the financial sector developments that are so increasingly puzzling and worrisome. This paper attempts to draw on considerable demographic data to show that a proper understanding of the emerging demographic profile of the world provides much understanding of what we observe in financial markets and gives a relatively simple framework for probing the future. That's pretty good, man. The first bit of interest rate story has to be the reprise of the fundamentals of the sector flow of funds, which is the backbone of every economy's financial markets. The sectors of the traditional analysis are households, businesses, government, and the foreign sector. After the fact, the flows between one and amongst these sectors must sum to zero. If households are in deficit, one, some, or all other surpluses uh, sectors must be in surplus. You can't have one way up here and one way down here. If governments are in deficit, Household and business sectors are in balance, thus the foreign sector, and, and if the household and business sectors are in balance, then the foreign sector must have financed the government deficit. Everything flows. You got a credit, you got a debit. It's accounting. You got a credit, you got a debit. You're crediting the Japanese with the U.S. That means the U.S. is in deficit, vice versa. I loan to the bank. The bank loans to you. I am giving you a credit. I have a credit in my account and a debit in your account. Where take, where I guess you do the opposite in that regard. But I'm, I'm actually the, I actually have the asset and you have the liability. Well, ex post all sub sectors sum to zero. It often happened that plans of the different sectors are not compatible. For example, if all the sectors except government are expecting to run surpluses. 
Net savings in these sectors can only be realized if the government sector is in deficit. If all sectors run surpluses, some of these plans cannot be really realized. If households are planning to be net savers and the income of the businesses and government sectors will be reduced as national income is lower than anticipated and business and government will tend towards deficit and the lower levels of income will reduce the ex post level of savings achieved by the household savers, household sector. So basis, I think this is fundamental. If uh, households are planning to be net savers, the income of the business and government sectors will be reduced as the national income is lower. Simply because they're hoarding, I hate to say hoarding, it sounds so mis mischievous, mischievous, but they're basically not loaning money out. There's, and the, one of the reasons I do this is because there's a lack of lending, the lack of borrowing. The plans and actual outcomes for the sectors produce corresponding flows of funds as the net wealth position of the sectors adjusts to the inflows and the outflows. Those changes are achieved in part by changes in the market interest rates, which cause a change in the plans of the sectors of the, as a clash of expectations is sorted out. Fundamental to the theory of how this happens that the intended levels of savings rise as interest rates rise and fall as interest rates fall. The intended level of savings fall as interest rates fall, i.e., I loan money, I more and more people borrow as interest rates fall. Less and less people save as interest rates fall. That makes sense, economic theory, but we have examples in China and Japan now too to show the exact opposite happens. In fact, I think this guy talks about the case in, in China. It's pretty interesting, actually. Remember that. As interest rates fall, theoretically, there'll be more borrowers and less savers. The lifeblood of financial services providers, which facilitates the intersectional flow of funds, is the creation of financial instruments that are the manifestation of the surplus and deficit conduct of the conduct of the sectors. Households that plan to run a deficit issue financial instrument, uh, instruments in the form of mortgages, car loans, student loans, credit card account increases, and so on, which in turn provide the opportunity for other sectors and households to realize their plan to save by acquiring these investments from the deficit households. Governments that plan to run a deficit issue bonds or non-interest bearing securities, which provide an opportunity for those intending to save to be able to realize that ambition. Again, a borrower is offset by a borrower. The government is offset by a loaner. You and I, the taxpayer, vice versa. Uh, a guy who borrows to buy a car is offset by a saver. The bank doesn't do it. The bank has to get deposits from somebody. So the bank is just an intermediary. But there's always it's a, um, a seesaw, but always it levels out. Every NFL team in the aggregate will be 8-8. Eight and eight. Just remember that. That always levels out. Every NFL team in the aggregate will be 8-8. Eight and eight. Businesses issue mortgages, bonds, and equities to enable them to spend more than they earn so as to invest in increased capacity, etc., these primary securities are purchased by other firms and by households that are planning to save. The foreign sector is the portal through which countries can globalize the adjustment to changes in the saving and investment behavior of the domestic sectors. The acquisition of foreign assets enables domestic savers to realize their ambition. Even if there are no domestic deficits to satisfy the appetite to acquire financial assets. Of course, the use of the foreign sector to balance the intersectoral flows of funds may also have exchange rate repercussions, which complicates the deal, the details, but not the overall dynamics of the adjustment. All right, let's take a break for one sec. The accumulation and extinguishment of debts and financial assets. The intermediation of financial institutions obscures the direct connection between the elemental actors and the flow of funds and the accumulation of financial claims. Getting a bank loan is, in reality, getting a loan from some other member of society through the services of the bank. The person who acquired the savings account with the bank is the real provider of the loan of the mortgage. The bank is the go-between. This is not just a pet pedantic distinction. The fact is that the focus is on the bank and not the real recipients and the real providers of credit makes it more difficult to see what may be happening when the financial markets produce unusual outcomes. The bank in turn may not rely on the uh, may not rely on the resources made available by its own deposit customers, but may sell the mortgage to a pension fund with a marked up cost. The pension fund in turn is a pool of resources of the members of the pension fund or pension plan, predominantly individuals about to retire or actually in retirement. 
The relationship between the ultimate saver and the ultimate borrower is further obscured by the sale of the mortgage by the bank and makes it even more difficult to see the different forces that are at work. While, the veil, while veiled by the institutions through which they are transacted, the byproduct of these activities uh, is that the accumulation of wealth in the form of the promises to pay that the deficit units issue to the surplus units under some terms. The intention of the soon-to-be deficit units to acquire tangible assets, a house, is facilitated by the surplus units and the intention of the deficit units to spend more than they earn and provides the savers with the asset they need to give effect to their intention to save. Of course, the saver is not motivated by the needs of the deficit unit, but rather is accommodating the needs of the deficit units in order to accumulate purchasing power that the saver will be able to enable future consumption. A lot going on there, but essentially at the end of the day, the saver ultimately isn't saying, hey, um, you're going to know I am the one who loaned you the money, but I just care that I have a return on what I'm lending to you above and what I could get someplace else in which that I can turn around later and use it to further consume my own savings, if that makes sense. That's all a saver cares about. All the lender cares about is getting the assets in which to acquire whatever he's trying to uh, accumulate. The mortgage used to buy the house creates a tangible asset with a stream of housing services while at the same time creating a stream of payments that provide the income stream that the savers want. The house owners are the providers of the income stream. And the house is the real asset that gives the savers or their bank confidence that the payments will be continued to be made. It's a collateral. Cast in these terms, the accumulation of debt by consumers, which is often castigated as bad in the media, can be seen as a necessary counterpart of the supposedly more virtuous behavior of savers. The interactions of surplus and deficits units in the economy and the creation of different kinds of debt instruments in this way lead to the gradual building of a stock of real assets, as well as production of the stock of the financial assets that savers require. The real assets once, create, once created last for half a century or more, house. The associated financial assets begin to disappear almost as soon as they are created as payments by the borrower consist of both principal and return of, cap, uh, return of capital and interest. Once a mortgage on a house is paid off, the income stream that the owner has provided to the savers is extinguished unless the owner is remortgaged in order to use some of the equity in the house to buy other assets or spend on consumption goods. Of course, there is still a stream of income produced by the house, but it's a form of housing services which are consumed by the owner and inhabitants. So while the tangible assets purchased by deficits, uh, deficit units accumulate, the income streams to savers are constantly dwindling and the savings repaid must be constantly reinvested in the purchases of new income streams. The latter process is invisible to the saver who, relying on the bank or investment fund, only sees the interest paid on their savings account or the growth of their pension assets or the mutual fund. All right. Ooh, ooh, you're getting heavy, big man. This guy's getting heavy. All right. The flow of funds analysis is a powerful tool for analyzing what is happening in the economy. It becomes even more powerful when it's modified to include the life cycle behaviors of the participants. And this is where it gets critical. By this, we mean, we mean the fact that as people, businesses, and nations grow, develop, and age, their financial behaviors change to reflect the changing motives and objectives of their stage in life. As people, businesses, and nations grow, develop, and age, their financial behaviors change to reflect the changing motives and objectives of their stage in life. While it may seem odd to apply the notion of life cycle to a business or a nation, each has their own aspects of life cycle transformation that emulate the life cycle behavior of households. In the case of nations, the life cycle transformations arise largely from the changing age structure of the populations. The life cycle aspects of businesses are well recognized. New businesses have risk and opportunity, innovation and real cost reduction, which attract people and firms to lend them money. The new business builds its asset value by using borrowed and shareholder money to expand its output and reduce its cost. Uh, gradually, the nature of the firm changes as the technology becomes standard and its income more predictable and less risky, and then becomes a dividend stock or cash cow. In both these stages, the firm is generating real products or service flows for the economy at the same time providing income streams to the bondholders and shareholders who own it. Eventually, many firms are eclipsed by competitors and go into a liquidation phase where the income streams they provided are extinguished. 
Of course, some firms uh, last a very long time through continuous uh, innovation and successful and fending off liquidation phase and the phases of development are not as obvious and predictable as the phases of household development, i.e. that's the business cycle, business life cycle. What is clear, however, is that continuous innovation development is necessary if savers are to have access to the business-based assets and their income streams. As with households, there is relentless extinguishment of a business source income stream as the invested capital is returned to the owners either as debt repayment or capital and dividend payments. An obvious exception. All right, let's go. I don't want to. Let's uh, pass over on the business. I want to go back to the, uh, the 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 country. All right, let's keep going. All right here. The, all right, so this is the life cycle, the normal rates of the world, and the determination of interest rates. So he's talking about the business life cycle. I, I don't want to get too deep in that. I, I probably went too far than I want to, but I want to talk about the human life cycle of a country and individuals, households. So for the purposes of understanding the movements of real interest rates, we can characterize these three phases of life cycle as applying as the supply of financial instruments phase, buying the house, the demand for financial instruments phase and the extinguishment of financial in instruments phase. Buying a house, I'm su the supply in which for me to buy the house, the demand for, I want to loan more money as I as achieve a certain level of, of uh, consumption that I've met. Now I got excess cash. I demand more uh, financial instruments phase so I can get more interest from my savings. And then the extinguishment, i.e. Uh, receiving my return principal. Of course, they're not mutually exclusive. A young family borrowing a car to buy a house, borrowing to buy a house, and other durables may also be setting aside money for retirement through pension plans as uh, retirement plans. The classification still holds them if we think in terms of all these activities in that terms. So there is a cohort that is basically trying to finance its spending and investment activities on favorable terms, a cohort that is trying to lend on favorable terms, and a small sector that is trying to uh, that's accumulate uh, a small sector that's trying to sell its accumulated assets at the best price to finance its last period of consumption. In normal development, as was experienced during most of the 20th century, the borrowing cohort was large and growing, as birth rates were generally far above replacement rates, and population grew overall. There was a corresponding surge in the supply of financial instruments that hopeful borrowers were offering to the saver cohort. There is a surge in supply of financial instruments that hopeful borrowers were offering to the saver cohort. The borrowing cohort, the baby boomers, was larger than the saver cohort and the cost of borrowing reflected that as limited supply of savings was rationed amongst the borrowers by upward movement and in interest rates. I hope that makes sense. The baby boomers were being financed significant. There's significant more baby boomers that lend borrowers than there were lenders to loan them money. And because of that it was rationed by interest rates. That was the price to borrow the money was the interest rates. The background of constant growth influenced not only the actual path of interest rates, but also the models the economists constructed to describe the economy and attempt to predict its course. The most favored uh, characteristic was uh, Keynes in his general theory of employment. His theory was solidly grounded on the presumption that population growth was normal feature uh, of the economy and that could safely assume that future population increases would be quite similar to those of the past. The core assumption of the theory was that household spending behavior was driven by the household's current income. The key parameter of the Keynesian system is called the propensity to consume. Keynes was aware of the fact that consumption behavior changed over the life cycle of the households. In fact, he had high praise for the 1928 theory of life cycle consumption that had been constructed by the brilliant mathematical economist Frank Ramsey. However, Keynes' model implies constant population growth in the belief that the trade-off between present and future consumption would not change as the economy grew. Given all other things that Keynes was addressing, the fact that population growth seemed to be an, a fact inexorable, he can be forgiven for allowing these assumptions to be built in the model, essentially saying, look, the population will continue to grow, i.e. there will be more lent borrowers and lenders. Keynes, like all other theorists of macroeconomics, economics, implicitly extended the behavior of an individual household to the economy as a whole. While this aggregation of households can be a useful approximation of what would 
be the current outcome of all households acting independently. In some circumstances, there are others in which it will not. One set circumstances we are currently living and will live for the next 50 years or more. I'll just pause there. We'll go to part two in here in just a second. 